Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? What if I told you these verses are taken entirely out of context? This passage in Malachi has been used as a tool to inspire or manipulate faithful people into giving 10% of their income as tithing donations for centuries. But what if I told you this passage wasn't written for the general body of the church, but was actually directed at the clergy of the church? To understand the full implication of these verses, it is crucial that we read the entire book of Malachi, starting with chapter 1, to get the comprehensive answer to the question, what does Malachi really say about tithing? Pull out your Bible and take notes with me. Here's the study key I created to mark these chapters by topic. Right off the bat, this is a heavy book. As we can see, it is the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel, and specifically the priests. Now, we won't read every verse from chapter 1 and 2. As you can see if you read it, there are several things the Lord is rebuking them for, but we're going to focus on the main thing. Follow along, and I promise we'll get the full understanding. In chapter 1, Malachi calls out the priests for dishonoring God, despising his name, and offering polluted sacrifices. The Levites were specifically responsible for priestly duties and temple worship, but it's evident that God is not happy with them. The priests had been offering lame, sick animals as their sacrifices, being deceitful as they kept the best ones for themselves. God said that these deceivers would be cursed. Chapter 2 starts by singling out the priests again, rebuking their behavior and commanding them to repent. God is telling the priests he has cursed them because they have corrupted the covenant of Levi and he is now extending a commandment specifically so that they can have a chance to return to the covenant again. The covenant with the Levites was life and peace as they feared God, spoke truth, and walked in peace and equity. Notice verses 5-7 through seven use past tense. God's covenant was with Levi. Truth was in his mouth. The priest's lips should keep knowledge, but these principles were not being upheld by the Levites. Verse 8 says that they had departed out of the way and forsaken their end of the covenant. Their actions were not equitable, and this corruption had caused many others to stumble. So what exactly were they doing that corrupted the covenant of Levi? To understand this, we need to go back to the beginning of the Mosaic Law and the inheritance of the tribes of Israel. The inheritance of the Levites had been established in the book of the law we now know as Deuteronomy, clearly stating that the Levites had no inheritance in Israel. In fact, the Israelites had special feasts every three years to feed outcasts and impoverished people such as widows, orphans, and foreigners, and the Levites were among that group. Other notable details about the Mosaic Law of Tithing is that if their tithed resources were too much to carry, they could sell it and use the money to buy what they needed. And there were times when the people had tithed sufficiently, and Moses commanded them to stop bringing their offerings. It was also a significant part of the law that they forgive every one of their debts every seven years, called the Shemitah. The Shemitah is a sabbatical year, or the year of the Sabbath, where no tilling or planting was to be done. This would be a year the people would live off of the resources they had saved in the storehouse. The Levites continued some of these traditions, like redeeming one's tithes in times of need and observing the seven-year Shemitah. However, there is a major difference when it comes to inheritance. Although the Mosaic law was clear that the Levites had no inheritance and they were counted among the lowest class, that law changed to give the Levites an inheritance taken directly from the tithes of Israel. So now, instead of the Levites receiving provisions every three years, they collected them on a regular basis, taking from the people's tithing. Here we see that the Levites had set up a system in which they collected all the tithes of Israel and took them as their inheritance. Then they would offer a tithe of the tithe to the Lord, meaning only 10% of Israel's tithing was actually going to the storehouse. This was a breach of their covenant and would definitely make God angry. We should recognize that the inconsistencies in Deuteronomy and Numbers concerning the Levites' inheritance are in fact evidence of the Levites corrupting the covenants as it said in Malachi chapter 2 verse 8. These contradicting laws were written by the deceivers for their own benefit. Their corruption was so widespread that they had effectively caused many to stumble. One reason the Levitical law had such a strong influence in the Old Testament is because the Mosaic book of the law we know as Deuteronomy was hidden and lost in the temple for 600 years and not recovered until the reign of the righteous King Josiah in the year 622 BC. King Josiah read the book of the law and ripped his clothes in mourning that his fathers had not obeyed the commandments of God and knew it would lead to their destruction. Jeremiah was the most prominent prophet during the time period documented in the end of 2 Kings, from the wickedness of Manasseh to the righteous King Josiah finding the book of the law. 
In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8, we see that he also rebukes the priests, politicians, pastors, and prophets for not seeking the Lord and transgressing against him. Another theory of how the Levitical law became so prominent in the Old Testament comes from the documentary theory of the Pentateuch, which proposes that the first five books in the Old Testament were written by four different sources, then later amalgamated into one cohesive story. The first three sources of the Pentateuch are the Yahwist, Eloist, and the Deuteronomist, essentially three authors contemporaneously recording the same events, then their notes were combined. The last source is called the Priestly Source, written by the Levites. It is the latest account, estimated to have been written 100 to 400 years after the first three. Biblical scholars have noticed some inconsistencies and contradictions in the Pentateuch and attribute them to the various authors of the records. The main focus of the priestly source was written to emphasize the importance of priests, the priesthood, Levitical law, and temple worship. Many scholars described the priestly source as a revisionist account meant to add details of importance about the Levitical priestly duties and laws. And as we know from Malachi and other prophets, the Levites' traditions were a corrupt perversion of God's covenants. Some scholars even call them the occult. Now that we understand the state of the priests and their abominations under the Levitical law, let's continue on with Malachi chapter 2. The priests' actions were clearly abominable, yet they were telling the people that everyone doing this evil were good men in the sight of the Lord. It seems many recognized this hypocrisy and felt contempt and disrespect towards the Levite priests. The priests even provoked God by insinuating they must not be that wicked because God had not sent his judgments on them, asking, where is the God of judgment? If we remember this was not written with chapter breaks, we see that the question asked in chapter 2 verse 17 is immediately answered in the first few verses of chapter 3. The Lord says he will send his messenger before he comes. As we'll see from several New Testament sources, Jesus taught that this was John the Baptist. After his messenger prepared the way, the Lord Jesus Christ would come and refine and purify the sons of Levi in the temple. As we know, this was exactly what Jesus did during his ministry. It's no wonder why Jesus spent so much time in and near the temple rebuking the hypocrisy and faithlessness of the priests. He routinely rebuked the chief priests, scribes, elders, Sadducees, and Pharisees, many of which held Levitical priestly positions and others who were powerful religious law enforcers. For anyone who would listen, the Lord refined and purified them, restoring Israel's faithful offering as in former years before the Levites corrupted them. And to those wicked ones who would not listen, their evil works were judged. Here the Lord says the Levites have been defying his ordinances for generations since the days of their fathers, but he's extending the invitation to repent and return to him. Then they ask what they need to do to return to him. The Levites of this day had grown up in the system of taking the tithes of the people as their own inheritance, and they did not know that this was not the Lord's way. God had to tell them the error of their ways. Verses 8 and 9 are most often used to imply that the general population of the Israelites was robbing from God, but reading this in context, it's so clear that it was the Levite priests who were robbing from God and the whole nation. The rest of the Israelites were doing their part offering their tithes. In fact, in their theocracy, tithing was akin to an obligatory tax. They were offering their tithes and bringing them to the authority in charge of handling them. It was the Levitical priests who were misusing those tithes and robbing from God and the nation. Not only was this a sin on their part, but the tithes in the storehouse were meant to be used in times of famine and need. Meaning when times were tough, there wasn't enough supply to go around and the people suffered. What the Levites had told the people was their right to take as their inheritance was a corruption of God's covenant, a burden on the nation, and this was why God had cursed them. This chapter prophesies of Christ coming to cleanse the temple and the priests of this wickedness, and we see examples of this throughout the New Testament. We will go more in depth about this towards the end of the video. We also know the Lord is merciful, and as he stated in verses 3 and 7, he is giving them a chance to return and enter into the covenant again. This is his commandment to offer them redemption. The Lord commands them to bring all the tithes to the storehouse, not just a tithe of the tithe. For centuries, the Levites had been relying on the tithes for their financial support and resources. Now God was asking them to give it all back and trust that he would take care of them. The Lord promised them that if they gave back all the tithing and put it all in the storehouse where it belonged, he would bless them so much they wouldn't be able to receive it. They would also be called blessed by the whole nation. Israel would rejoice to see all of their tithes being stored in the treasury for times of need. Instead of taking the Lord's invitation to repent and return the tithes, the priests complain against the Lord and say he has been too harsh. Again, they ask a question, what have we said against you? 
the Lord answers them by saying, you have said it is vain to serve God. The Hebrew translation of the word vain in verse 14 means useless. They thought it was useless to serve God. They had been personally profiting from the ordinance of tithing as they practiced it, and they were not ready to give it up. And finally, the Hebrew translation of verse 15 puts a nail in the coffin. So now we call blessed the presumptuous, for those that do wickedness are raised up. Yes, they even tempt God and go free. The Levitical priests had been called out. They were doing wickedness while being raised up as religious leaders and temple officiants and walking free, thinking they were not judged by God. When they heard this, most rejected the Lord's commandment to return to the covenant, but not all. Some of the priests feared the Lord and repented. The Lord wrote their names in the Book of Remembrance. But in verse 18, he says they must return and discern who among them is righteous or wicked. It requires discernment to know which priests or church clergy truly serve God. In the next verses, moving on to chapter 4, we see what happens to those priests who do not truly serve God but serve themselves. The Lord makes it clear that the priests who do not repent will be burned with the wicked. This image makes it even more evident how important it is that we utilize discernment with religious leaders to know if they truly serve God or if they will also be burned with the wicked and proud. To end, Malachi repeats the same prophecy from the beginning of chapter 3. Before the Lord comes to purify the sons of Levi in the temple, Elijah will come to prepare the way. And if this were not to happen, he would smite the earth with a curse. This curse has already been mentioned in each preceding chapter, chapter 1 verse 14, chapter 2 verse 2, and chapter 3 verse 9. The curse is on their blessings and prosperity for being deceivers and robbing God and the entire nation of Israel. So we can conclude that within the context of the entire book of Malachi, these three verses in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, are not directed at the whole nation or the general membership of the church. These are commandments to the Levitical priests who had been profiting from and living off of tithes for generations. God is extending his arm, offering repentance and a restoration of the covenant with their fathers. While studying these chapters, rereading and remarking them, I couldn't help but notice a pattern in the language in chapters 3 and 4. I believe together these chapters present a chiasmus or chiasm, the central point being the commandment to the Levitical priests. Chapter 2 verse 1 says this commandment is for the priests, but the book of Malachi does not give a commandment until chapter 3 verse 10, which is for the sons of Levi to repent and stop stealing the nation's tithes. The entire book of Malachi is a commandment for the sons of Levi to return to the covenant of their fathers, or in other words, to turn their hearts to them and be restored in their promise. As chapters 3 and 4 prophesied, the work of Elijah as the messenger was to prepare the people to receive Jesus and restore the true covenant of their forefathers. This prophecy is confirmed to be fulfilled by the voices of the angel Gabriel and Jesus Christ, who testified that John the Baptist would be filled with the spirit of Elias, turn the hearts of the people, restore all things, and prepare the way before Jesus. The names Elijah and Elias refer to the same person. Elijah is the Hebrew translation of the name used in the Old Testament, and Elias is the Greek translation of the name used in the New Testament. After John the Baptist fulfilled his role as Elias, preparing the way for Christ, Jesus rebuked the Levite priests in the temple and called them to repentance, just as Malachi had prophesied. In Luke 20, verse 46, through chapter 21, verse 6, remember the Bible was not written with these chapter breaks, right after riding into Jerusalem on the young colt on Palm Sunday, Jesus tells a big audience of people to beware of the scribes who sit in the highest seats in the synagogues wearing their long robes. He shames them for devouring the widows' houses and getting rich off of the widows' might. Jesus prophesied that their temple, adorned with the best stones, would be destroyed and thrown down. The fine sanctuary they had built was worthless to God. What was truly valuable was the widow's heart. The widow loved God and was faithful and obedient to the law as it was taught to her. The problem is, the law as she was taught it was corrupted by these men who lifted themselves up above all the people. Jesus came to purge the corrupt spiritual authorities, curse them for robbing the nation if they did not repent and return the tithes, and set his true followers free from the reign of their religious hierarchy. If the Levitical priests were true followers of God, they would be taking care of the poor and needy widows and fatherless, not requiring them to surrender their last coins to the church's deep pockets. Jesus continues to show his true feelings regarding the orthodox tithing collection procedures at the temple in Matthew 21. Where Jesus directed his rage in the temple courts is so significant. 
To those who sold and bought, he simply drove out, but he overthrew the tables of the money changers. The job of the money changers was to exchange different forms of currency for valid coins to pay temple tax or tithing. Jesus also threw the chairs of those who sold doves, which were purchased usually by the poor to offer as a sacrifice for guilt. It is so profound that Jesus made such a public display of condemning the orthodox system of compulsory tithing as it robbed the poor and further weighed them down with guilt and shame instilled by their religious authorities. In Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 24, Jesus spoke against storing up treasures of the earth. In fact, he declared, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Immediately after this, he tells his disciples to take no thought for their lives, not what they will eat or what they will wear, but God would clothe them as he clothes the lilies and the grass of the field. This is the framework for how the kingdom of God operates on earth. Jesus took no thought of the physical world or its obsession with monetization. He taught his disciples not to worry about money so they could exercise faith and witness the miracle of God's provision. This is the pattern God has always used to accomplish his work, just as he had done hundreds of years earlier with the prophet Elijah. During a three and a half year drought, God told Elijah to go to a brook in the wilderness where he had commanded ravens to feed him. They brought him bread and meat each morning and night. When the brook dried up, God sent him to a city where he prepared a widow to feed him. When Elijah met the widow, she was hesitant to give him bread because it was the last portion of grain she had left before she and her son would starve. Elijah made the bold promise that God would not let her barrel of grain go empty until the drought ended. The widow mustered her faith and made bread for Elijah to eat, and the words of Elijah were fulfilled. They all ate for many days, and the barrel never ran out. When Jesus called his disciples, he taught them to rely solely on faith for all of their needs. By putting full trust in God for their provision on their spiritual missions, he would take care of every physical need. He led by example by demonstrating the miracle of the loaves and the fishes to feed thousands, and telling his disciples exactly where to find the donkey he rode on Palm Sunday. When it was time to pay tax, instead of asking one of his followers for money, he made money miraculously appear by telling Peter to cast his hook into the sea and the first fish he caught would have a coin in its mouth. These are just small examples of the miracles Jesus said his disciples would replicate, as he said, He that believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. In Luke chapter 10 verses 3-8, through 8, Jesus sent his disciples out to preach two by two. Among the instructions he gave them, he told them to carry neither purse nor scrip. They would take no money with them, meaning they would have no means to buy food. This was an exercise of faith meant to sharpen their attunement to the Spirit to be guided, just like Elijah, to fellow believers who were ready to accept them. Jesus told them when they enter into a city to find a house where the people accept their peace and there they would be fed. This is an important characteristic of the kingdom of heaven on earth, followers of Jesus Christ inviting each other into their homes and ministering to them. Christians take care of each other with community and relationships, not with corporate bank accounts. So now that we know the true history of tithing in the Bible, what does this mean for us? First of all, it would be wise to be wary of religious leaders who use these out-of-context verses to manipulate strict obedience to the principle of tithing. We can heed the warning in Malachi 3 verse 18 and pray to discern between the righteous and the wicked to be able to know who truly serves God and who doesn't. If the preachers preach that the Old Testament law of tithing applies to us today, we should consider why they don't also teach about the feast to feed the poor every three years, the seven-year Shemitah of forgiving debts and giving the land a rest, selling our saved goods for money to buy what we need, or ceasing to pay tithing when the reserve is full. All of these things were integral parts of the Mosaic Law of Tithing. However, churches today only cherry-pick the one part that benefits them, paying a 10% tithe. And although many use the tithes of their congregations to benefit the church and community, others do as the Levites and use it to profit themselves. Secondly, study the Bible to gain a better understanding of what the principle of tithing really was and what Jesus really taught about money. Jesus came to correct the erroneous ways of the Levites and teach the true law, and at no time did he mention tithing. He taught to rely on God's miraculous provision, to care for the poor and the needy, and that giving should always be done according to your heart, never of necessity. Some pastors forfeit the idea of tithing altogether and focus on Jesus' teaching of free will offerings. 
At times, we may be compelled by the Spirit to donate money or other goods to an individual or organization. Today, there are many churches and charities that do great things for their communities with proceeds collected from their congregations. This is an important part of our society today, so long as the fiduciaries are honest with the money and use the funds for the benefit of the community as intended. Like Malachi 3.18 counsels, we need to discern between those that truly serve God and those that don't. We have the opportunity or expectation to be spiritually minded with our money and resources and make sure it goes to good causes. We must be in the habit of seeking God's inspiration to know who we can bless and also maintain full trust in God's provision when we don't have enough. Miracles will be seen in both the giving and the receiving. As the messenger of this biblical truth, I have been holding back tears while preparing this message. I've been overcome with gratitude and awe that God has made me a witness of his miraculous provision again and again just this year, as God convicted me and my husband to leave the high-demand religion that we were raised in for a more fulfilling relationship with Jesus Christ. During this faith transition, we made the choice to move across the country to start our lives over, and while it brought beauty, it also brought trials and hardship. When all our efforts were not enough, we doubted it would work out, but we chose to cast out all doubt and know that God had performed miracles before and he would do it again. We could not have imagined the blessings that God gifted us with. They were so much more that we felt worthy to receive. We had friends send us money out of the blue, we had unexpected checks show up at the perfect time, and we had a landlord accept our rental application over 17 more qualified applicants when we were on the verge of homelessness. We have also been blessed to witness miracles in others' lives as we felt inspired to offer our time and resources. A beautiful community of believers has been built by walking in faith in God's provision and being generous with free will offerings. This is exactly how Jesus established his kingdom by teaching us to love one another and bear each other's burdens. As it says in Galatians 6-2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ.